yeah, that's a little introduction to uh, what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to open in prayer. Father, I thank you we can be here. We open our hearts and our minds to your word. Help us to apply it and put it into action. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to look at some practical ways, and I've spoken on fear before, but I, I, I want to see if there's any fear in you, and if you can identify it, and if you can identify it, you can obviously overcome it. But one of the things the devil likes to do is to do covert operations of fear. It's so that you don't know that it's a spirit of fear that's driving you to do certain things or behave in certain ways. And it's a bit like a lobster being put in a pot of salty water and then slowly brought to the boil. He's totally unaware of what is happening to him until it's too late. And that's how the devil likes to operate with the spirit of fear. And I'd like to put to you that all your thoughts could be brought down just to two simple things, love and fear. You either walk in love or you walk in fear. Life or death, you choose. So thoughts of love will help you to grow. They make you grow as a person. They make your world bigger. Thoughts of fear decrease you, and they make your world very small. Thoughts of fear and living with fear will long-term wise, especially if, if it's a, a flight or fight type of fear, will cause you to be anxious and will cause anxiety. And I think it's something like 64 days of fear ring something will cause anxiety in you. And when you get anxiety, you get panic attacks, sweats, everything else. So fear operates in the spiritual realm and can be based on past or future events and is always experienced in the present. And nobody is immune to fear, but if you know it's a spirit and as a child of God, and as how beautifully Sandra said, you have authority in the name of Jesus, you can overcome fear. How do I know it's a spirit? 2 Tim 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. So fear is a spiritual thing, and it will jump upon you at times. It operates in a spiritual realm, and it wants to get into your mind. It wants to cloud your mind. But the first step is to recognize it. So I want to look at seven types of fear, and then we'll look at some ways to overcome those. We won't complete them all this week, but it'll give you an idea of some of those fears in action. So when one of those fears resonates with you, and you think, oh, I might have been operating in that, I want you to set your mind to work on it with the Holy Spirit to overcome it, okay? So if, if anything I say, ah, that's for me, we're going to work on that. So the first one, relationships. Now I think, John, there's a slide coming up, um, which I just want to, the devil loves to mess with relationships. Partners, husbands and wives, friends, parents, he loves to mess with relationships. And I preached a sermon some time back called The Fear Dance. And if you can remember, 
it's what the relationships kind of do. They hurt. An event happens, you hurt. You want to be responded to lovingly, okay? You fear that you're not going to get the response you want, so you react. And when you react, you cause hurt. And then you hurt the other person. So then you hurt. They want to be loved and encouraged and covered over. They fear they're not going to get that, so they react. And then a whole thing starts to do the old, remember the wall stance, and it spirals round and round and round and round, going downwards. And eventually, one person will withdraw and go and sulk or say, I've had enough of this, and walk away, which is exactly what the devil wants. And it'll, the dance will then restart again every single time until it goes on and on and on, until you, people get so fed up with it that they either live with it, they accept it, or they try and sort it out. But that sort of happens a lot in relationships, especially intimate relationships. And the darts never ends until one person withdraws. Okay, number two, a fear of lack. Lots of people have a lack. They make decisions purely based on money or tightness in giving. And it leads to a lack of generosity. And it's a fear of not having enough. I haven't got enough. I've got to save some more. You know, you hear millionaires living in a really poverty because they can't, don't want to spend anything. They're trapped in a fear of lack. Number three, another fear people have is what others may think of you. What are they thinking of me? What do they really think about me? So, that's a fear of what others may think of you. Number four, a fear of the future outcome based on the unknown or a past experience. It could be, I'm frightened of catching COVID. Past experience, but you're frightened it could become a future event. It could be just something, a fear of the future outcome because you don't know. And it can paralyze someone from making a decision. You ever seen a rabbit caught in the headlights of a car? It just doesn't know what to do. It's just sitting there in the middle of the road. It can't go left, it can't go right, it's just blinded. And often it can paralyze people to making a decision. And sometimes just making a decision one way or the other is better. Number five, similar, a fear of not pleasing people or failing to live up to someone else's expectation. That's another fear that you might develop or can come upon you. What would the pastor say if you saw this? He's outside. <laughs> Okay, a fear of something perceived as dangerous. That can be, you know, a snake, it could be a grass snake, but you perceive it as dangerous. Number seven, a simple fear of not being in control of your life. You've, you've lost control. You just, you're losing it completely. You can't control anything. And it's that fear that tries to control and make others do things. Sometimes you're not even aware that you're controlling others to get your own way. So these are some 
of the common fears. There are many more, but these are some that you might experience and might have resonated. But how on earth are you going to overcome these fears? You know, what do you do to get rid of these? So the Bible tells us fear, you know, is really, I like to think of take fear as an anagram and say, Fear is false evidence about reality. It's just not true. 1 John 4.18 said, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. You see, you're punishing yourself. You're beating yourself up all the time. Or you're projecting it on somebody else, but you're punishing yourself or the relationship or the situation. But when you step into love, then it changes everything. Love is the way to victory in every circumstance. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 gives us a way forward to put something in place to build upon. And it says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So to overcome, you're going to need, I'm going to change the order a little here, hope, faith, and then love. Hope, biblical hope, is not, I hope this is going to be, this sermon's going to go down okay. That is not biblical hope, okay? Hope is saying, I'm preaching the word, the word is going to change people, okay? And I have an expectation that when I preach the word, it affects people's hearts. So, hope is an expectation of what is written in the Bible will manifest in your life, okay? So you need hope. Without hope, you've got no foundation to start with. Step two, faith. You've got to put faith, which is trusting in God. It's an assurance of what God says will manifest, like hope, but in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, now faith is. It's in the present. You've got to believe that now it's going to happen. And then you apply love. Now, faith and love are both actions. I'm hoping God's word's true. I believe it is. The devil believes it is too. But nothing changes. It's only when you apply faith working with love that things change. Because you're now doing something, you're confronting something. And as Pastor Sandra said, it could be just exercising your authority in Jesus Christ. Because remember, when Jesus ascended, he said, all authority I give unto you. So we have authority, but do we use it? And then the motive must be love. You you know, you can't just manipulate the world. I mean, I was in traffic the other day, and I was just thinking, you know, Samson murdered all of the Philistines. Surely, Lord, I can just hoot my horn once, just once, to wake them up. They're sitting there, the lights are green, they haven't moved just once, surely. And uh, the Lord just said, you, you're fearful of being laid. Because I, I wanted to be somewhere and this person was holding me up. The motive behind was fear. But I couldn't see it. They were just, I just wanted to hoot my horn, you know. Tempting as it was. Praise God I didn't. I walked by love and waited. Amen. So the action you take must be loving. Okay? 
John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. He gave. Love is all about giving. It's not about taking. It's about giving. And when you give it, it comes back to you. Everything in the kingdom of God starts by giving. And whatever you give, God says he will return to you, multiplied. It's a multiplying principle. Sadly, it also works with fear that that multiplies too. If you give out fear, that multiplies. But when you give out love, it casts out fear. Love is always brighter and stronger than fear. You know, uh, love will eventually overcome all fear. Otherwise, the world will be getting worse and worse and more and more fearful, and it isn't. There are pockets of fear, I know. But generally, the world is not getting worse and worse and worse. Love is overcoming, bit by bit. So let's go back to number one, relationships. How do you overcome? How did we get out of that fear dance? Can we put the fear dance up again, John, just to remind ourselves of that fear dance? So you're in a relationship and the fear dance starts. How on earth do you stop that I hurt, I want, I fear, I react and cause hurt? And that spiral downwards. How can I apply hope, faith and love? Let's have a look in the word. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I hurt, I don't think my need's gonna be met. I fear, I can feel that fear of not be met, but now I choose to react totally differently. I change my voice, I turn it down, and I give a gentle answer. And just doing that very simple thing, very simple thing, turns the argument away. It breaks the dance. Sometimes it may be because you're tired. Maybe you're hungry. Maybe you're just worn out. And just that gentle answer, or sometimes, darling, or if it's somebody, a friend, do you mind if we find a better time to talk about this? Not when I'm tired, I'm just, it's not gonna go, we're just gonna get into this mode. Let's, let's talk about it tomorrow. Or set a time to talk, talk about it. Obviously, I'm not meeting a need here. And I'm not ready to react fully to that need. So maybe I need time to think. Men, sometimes it's a good thing to go outside the door, shut the door, cool off, chill, come back in, and then react in the right way. You break the fear dance. Number two. A fear of lack. This is a trust issue, okay? Your trust is in money. You're looking for money to be the solution to all of your problems. And money does buy a lot of solutions. But true financial prosperity is based on trusting God working through you. And God's going to bless me. He's going to make me a millionaire. No, he's not a counterfeiter. He will bless the hands, well, whatever you put your hands to. You have to work, but he will bless you in that. As I said, you are like cream in a bottle of milk. You will always float to the top. Okay? Don't have to be concerned. God is with you, you work hard, you work for him, and he will prosper you. Hope. Proverbs 10, 22. The blessings of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. So you can work, and it's not hard. It's an enjoyable work. It's without 
painful toil because it's not dri- you're not driven by money. You're driven because you're working through the Lord. I love this one. Proverbs 19.17 says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they've done. I have never seen any ministry that works with the poor, poor. The Salvation Army is one of the richest churches in the world. And guess what? They work with the poor. Why? Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. What does that really mean? Can you imagine lending money to God? For, you know, if you could, let's say, I take my money and I'm going to lend it to the Lord. Can you imagine God being in debt to you? That would mean the created is now controlling, because there's a debt, the creator. And he will never be in debt. Can't happen. So when you lend to the poor, when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord, and he is faithful, will reward you and multiply it back to you. Check any poor ministry that ministers with the poor, they're never poor. The ministry itself is never poor. And I live opposite the Sally Army headquarters, and the amount of fireworks that they... I know that their their, um, general of the Salvation Army, he loves fireworks, and whenever he comes, there's always fireworks. But I also know they were given masses of gyms all over America not long ago. Um... And there are various donors that have have given millions to the Salvation Army. But you see, people give because they know they work with the poor. And when you work with the poor, you're lending to God. So if you want to sort of get rid of some of that fear of lack, just be generous to poor. I think the Bible is a little bit biased, only a little bit but it's more biased to the poor than it is to the wealthy. Fear of what others may think of you. Um, Psalm 139, 14 says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Hope, I know that I'm wonderfully made because God made me just as I am. God made me. He doesn't make mistakes. He made me the way I am. Faith, I praise you even when it's difficult, even when the situations aren't in my favor. I will praise you. I will worship you. Love is doing just that, giving God the praise, the honor, the glory in all circumstances, the good times and the bad times. That's how you overcome. And you begin to see yourself, well, if God made me, he must be pleased with me. He didn't make me, I don't like this little bit here. This arm isn't quite as long as this arm. or God made me just as I am. And I should take comfort that God has made me in this way. He is pleased with me. And who am I to complain to God? The creator. Why should the created talk to the creators? I'm not happy with this little bit you sculpted here. No. God did it for a reason. Accept the way you are. God loves you the way you are. And if he's pleased with you, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I always tell the story, I asked God about Sandra's hair once. And he said, what about it? I love it. I said, if you love it, Lord, I love it, I adore it. Never have that conversation again. (laughs) 
I mean, you can take it to the extreme. You know, you've heard the story of a mother praising a son because he really felt he was the image of, he really got hold of it. He was the image of God's son. And it was confirmed every time he walked into a, a room full of ladies. They all said, oh my God. You know, it, it's, you can take it to the extreme. But, but generally, God made you be happy with the way you are. I'm a little bit overweight. No, I'm not. God made me. Just relax. If you're not, if I'm a little bit too thin, maybe I need to eat a bit more. Just relax. God made you this way. At the right time, if you feel unhappy, he will help you overcome whatever difficulty you might have. Relax and just be happy and say, Lord, I am wonderfully made. Great thing to do every morning. Lord, I am wonderfully and perfectly made because you made me. You're recognizing the creator. You're overcoming. Jeremiah, uh, sorry, number four, fear of future outcomes based on the unknown or the past. I mean, I can remember the past. Uh, Rebecca will probably vouch for this one. If you're in a wobbly canoe and you see a wave coming, the fear level goes up because you know it's very easy to capsize. And after you've capsized once or twice, every time you see a wave, there's almost an expectation that you're going to fall in. So some of those things, um, you can get a fear that isn't necessarily true. It's just based on the past experiences. So one way to overcome things, especially in the future, is Jeremiah 29.11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God is on your side. He has a plan for your life. And it's not a bad plan. Actually, if you go with it, it's going to prosper you and give you hope. Okay? Just stay with the plan. Faith. Genesis 13.8. This is about Abraham and Lot. Um, and this was before Abraham. Ab he was originally called Abraham. So Abraham and said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left... I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. How could he say that? Love gives, so he's giving. He knows the hope, I'll be blessed whichever direction I go. You know, sometimes by not making and confronting a fear, you're not making a decision. And not making a decision is worse than making a, you know, it, than making a decision. And sometimes if you just say, I'm going to make a decision, I'll be blessed whatever way I go. Yeah? I mean, there is a balance. Sometimes you have to wait for God's timing. I put that in there. But sometimes people just, I don't want to make a decision. I'm waiting on the Lord. And they'll wait on the Lord forever. I met someone the other day. He's been waiting 40 years on the Lord to make a decision. Make a decision knowing the hope you will be blessed whether you go left or whether you go right. Every time God breaks through, when you make those kind of decisions and you put hope, faith and love together, you weaken fear in your life every single time. It gets weaker and weaker. We started with a video, which was Isaiah 41.10. And it says this, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. 
You see, you've got to confront those fears walking in the ways of the love, love because you know God is good, God is love. His plans are to prosper you, not to hinder you. Or, you know, he said his burden his, you know, is light. Yeah, you have to do some things. Yes, you have to take, make decisions. Yes. But it, it's staying with the plan gets you through. And it will prosper you. But obviously, if you don't know Jesus, you can't go anywhere. It starts by making connection with that relationship. And then all the other relationships get sorted out. Bit by bit by bit. So let's get the worship team up. And we're going to worship, but if anything I've said challenges you today, if there's a fear that you, I didn't know I was under that one, I never, you know, just like I said about the hooting of the horn, behind that was a fear of being late, you know? Been in a rush. You see, God doesn't want us to be in a rush. He's never in a hurry. And so I didn't even know there was a spirit of fear in operation. And sometimes you're not even aware. But if something I've said made you aware, I, I want you to come out. I'm going to pray. And what we're going to use this as a battleground to making an assault on that fear to weaken it and break it down with the hope of the Holy Spirit. See, God will give you words from the Bible to apply to your life. That is what I call the revealed word of God. That's the Holy Spirit revealing the word to you. The more word you know, the more the Holy Spirit can reveal to you because he's highlighting his word. And once you've got it highlighted, you walk in it. Yeah, and that's how you free yourself and learn to walk in the, you know, live in the spirit and walk by love. But if there's some kind of fear, I want you to come out and it's going to be a starting point. This is the beginning where you take down those walls. Okay, it's where we break it. And I want you to, when you leave, to feel that you've left it here. And that this is the day you made a start. This was the day of your comeback. This is where you, it got broken and now you're free and you'll experience a new freedom. If it's the fear dance, it's been broken. I'm going to take that scripture, I'm going to apply it a gentleness with my voice. I'm going to be mindful of what I say. So let's worship, let's turn the lights down and just come forward when you're... Uh, when you,